So glad that you're watching this today. And if you're um, getting to the point where you're you're willing to uh, to gather once again, I just want to let you know we are currently meeting at our location at 503 North Main Street Extension. We're having worship services at 9 o'clock and at 1030. And then there are Sunday school classes uh, throughout at, at several different times throughout the morning. And so if you want to be involved in one of those, just let us know and we'll try to point you in the right direction. Um, also, I wanted to let you know on our church website, there's a way, first of all, for you to sign and fill out or for you to fill out an online connection card. If you would take the time this morning or whenever you're watching this to do that, just let us know that you've um, you watched. And then also you can pray um, and also you can share any prayer concerns that you might have there on the connection card. And there's also a link on our website for online giving. Um, if you're, if you're viewing the website on a, a cell phone, those links will be at the top. If you're on the web page on a web browser on a computer, those will be at the bottom of the page. So make sure you take advantage of, uh, of our church website. Today, we're, it's the final message in this series that we called uh, Good News and False Views. And so the thought behind the series is that there are these, these wonderful, amazing uh, concepts shown to us in the Word of God, these, these high ideals uh, that are taught, and they're, they're amazing, wonderful things. They're things like love and grace and mercy and faith and justice and hope. And these are things taught to us in the Scripture, uh, the Scriptures, because these are a part of what God is like, right? So these are a part of God's character, and because they're a part of God's character, these things are also meant to be exemplified in the lives of God's people. If you remember, we were created is to be image bearers of God. And though that has been corrupted by sin, um, in Jesus, our role as image bearers has been restored. And therefore, we are to not only go and preach the gospel, but we also must commit ourselves to being Jesus' representatives, right? Jesus' ambassadors here. This is exactly what Paul talks about in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 18 and 19, where he says, All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of, of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So we are to bear the image of God, right? We must communicate uh, through that, communicate God's character, not only through words, but also through our actions as well. We see that love, grace, mercy, faith, justice, hope are not just attitudes of our heart, but they have to work their way out so that they change the way we behave. They change our actions. So in dealing with these concepts um, over the last several weeks, many of the false views have had something along the line to do with uh, the thought of, well, I don't have to do anything. And I hope what you've seen as we've gone through these is if you remove uh, repentance, if you remove life change, if you remove bearing good fruit, if you remove being transformed and having your minds renewed, if you remove those things from the gospel, then you have a very different message than the one taught to us by Peter, Paul, John, James, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and even Jesus himself. So today's word, today's concept is peace. Somebody uh, this week brought up, when I, when I mentioned to them I was talking about peace, had mentioned, you know, hey, remember the beauty pageants back in the day when, 
when um, they got to the question and answer section and all of the contestants seemed to say, when they were asked if they could have one thing, what would it be? What was the typical answer to that question? It was world peace, right? Well, here's the problem. The world has never had a good estimation of what peace really is. So, you know, everybody wants peace in their marriage and their families and their workplaces and their country and the world. And, you know, we live in the United States and our country has the best medical, the best psychological treatment centers. We have the highest educational institutions, worldwide communication ability. Yet here we are. And we have all of these things. And most people are without peace. And we're devastated and broken. Our marriages are broken. Our families are splitting apart. Hatred, rebellion, financial anxiety. Our country is unsettled. And let me just say this. The world will offer you peace. And it will offer it through escapism, drugs and alcohol, immoral relationships, constant entertainment. It's sought through all forms of pleasure and self-satisfaction, even positive thinking. And see, many believe that peace, that the definition of peace is the absence of trouble. And they refuse to face the problems in their lives, believing that in doing that, in just refusing to face problems, they're going to find peace. But the world has never held the answer. Church, I want to ask you, and I bet you will know this answer. Do you know where true peace comes from? Well, the answer is Jesus. I've heard some Bible critics say that Jesus contradicts himself when he talks about peace. Um, what, do you, what do you think of that? Does Jesus contradict himself? See, I think if we see a what looks like a contradiction in the teachings of Jesus, I would say it's because we're not understanding what he's saying. And so here's what I want us to do today. I want us to look at what God has to say in regard to peace. We'll look at some places throughout the Bible. We'll try to get a handle on what God says about peace. But I want us to begin today by looking at a quote from the prophet Isaiah. And you'll probably remember uh, these verses, you'll remember hearing these verses sometime around Christmas time, right? They are the inspiration to that wonderful piece of music called Messiah by Handel. And so we're going to read Isaiah's prophecy of the coming Messiah. It was something that was written approximately 740 years before the coming of Jesus. And here's what Isaiah wrote. This is Isaiah 9. 6 and 7. It says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end, and he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So the, the coming Messiah, right? And that word means chosen one. But in the context of old, the Old Testament Jews, there was this one who was coming who was going to fit the description given here by Isaiah. <clears throat> he would be a king who would deliver his people. He would be a descendant of David, and yet at the same time be mighty God himself. This delivering king would bring righteousness, he would bring justice, and he would bring peace. And this is why when we get to the Gospels, we're told of this story of the birth of Jesus, right? And, and angels show up, and what do they proclaim? Like when you go to Luke chapter 2, we're told of that, that story of the shepherds out watching their flocks, and then an angel shows up 
proclaiming that the Messiah was born in Bethlehem. And then in verses 13 and 14, here's what it says. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Here is something we need to understand when it comes to the peace that Jesus brought with him. You've heard me speak about this a lot over the years. It's the fact that Jesus' mission is all about reconciliation. He came to fix and restore relationship. And because of our rebellion, what have we done? Because of our rebellion, we've actually set ourselves up as God's enemy. And if no one's ever told you this before, I want to tell it to you today. God doesn't want to be your enemy. So what did he do? He makes peace. So Jesus is the means of that, to that peace. Listen to how Paul puts it when he writes the church at Colossae. This is Colossians chapter 1, 15 through 23. Here's what that section says. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. Listen to this. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. You see, we set ourselves up as God's enemies, but Jesus came to offer peace. That means God has made a way for you and for me to approach him and to be restored. And our relationship toward God doesn't have to be adversarial anymore. We can now exist at peace with God. We are free from accusations it says, right? We're free from the accusations hurled at us by the true enemy. Do you realize who the true enemy is? Do you know what the accuser does? He keeps track of your failings. He keeps track of your mess-ups. He holds that information as ammunition against you. But he holds it not because of some underlying conviction about right or wrong. No, he holds it because he hates you. And he wants to see you judged and suffering the same fate that's in store for him. And what angers Satan even more is that God offers redemption to human beings. He offers forgiveness to human beings, reconciliation, peace. See, this 
is the peace Jesus is the prince of. We'll talk about this a little bit more in October, but realize there are spiritual forces that do not want human beings to be at peace with God. This is why Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 12, he said, Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So this peace offer that God makes with humanity through Jesus also results in a ramping up of hostility from the forces that long to see humanity destroyed. These forces are going to appeal to the worst parts of the human heart. These forces want to see people fight and argue and bicker. These forces find joy in seeing human beings destroy each other. They use our sinful desires as, as the very weapons against us. And what is their goal? Their goal is to lead us away from the peace agreement offered to us by God in Jesus Christ. This is what James talks about when he writes James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, where he says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you don't have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. And you do not have because you do not ask. And when you do ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or don't you think the scripture says without reason, that he jealously longs for the spirit he is called to dwell in us. But he gives us more grace. That's why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. See, we really do need, we really do need to choose who we're going to side with. Jesus or the world? If you say you side with Jesus, you must humble yourself. This is not something available. This is not something that is available to the proud. It's only available to those who will humble themselves before the Lord. Because if you're hanging on to the world, you don't have a free hand to reach out to Jesus. And though this is something where people can, can, can choose, we have the free will to choose God, we have the free will, free will to choose the world, the reality is, is that there will be people who will humble themselves. There will be people who will choose Jesus, and then there will be those who remain in their pride and choose the world, and that choice is heartbreaking. This is what Jesus meant in Matthew 10. In that section where, where, uh, where people think Jesus contradicts himself, what Jesus says there is, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have, come to bring, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. 
I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. That's Matthew 10, 34 through 39. So what is Jesus saying here? He's saying that everyone's going to have to choose whether they're going to follow him or not. And even within families, some will choose Jesus and some will choose the world. But we must choose to be faithful to Jesus. And here's where it becomes hard. We must choose to be faithful to Jesus even over our family ties. I've been there. You know, when, when family ridicules the decision that you've made, you be faithful to Jesus. When they refuse to support the life that you've chosen, you choose Jesus. When they try to judge you for the past mistakes and, and then try to draw you back into that way of life, you choose Jesus. See, Jesus was not contradicting the other scriptures by saying that he has not come to bring peace but a sword. He's talking about the reality that the gospel is going to cause division. But the division doesn't come from the message. It comes from the decision of those who have decided to listen to the adversary, to refuse and to mock the offer of God. This is why we see Jesus telling his followers in John chapter 14, all of this I have spoken while I'm still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give it as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. That's John 14, 25 through 27. So there is this very real peace that comes with being a follower of Jesus. And that peace is tied to having the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within you. And that peace is not peace like the world defines it. The world says um, there will only be peace when you agree with them and you do what they do. Peace with the world and peace with the adversary only comes when you forsake God. And in that scenario, even compromise is treason. Jesus says there is no peace there. There is no reconciliation with God there. Yet, the people of Jesus are to be people of peace. So what does that mean? That means we are to be, first of all, at peace with each other. Paul speaks about that in 1 Thessalonians, as well in other places there in Thessalonians. He's writing Christian people, and he says there in verses 1 through 3, that in the end of all things, the world will be saying, peace, peace. But the end will come upon them suddenly. So that's not the kind of peace God is wanting for his people, right? It seems that the world will be all united in their stand against the Lord and be at peace with that decision. Then just a few verses later, he talks about the peace that is to exist among God's people, how they are supposed to honor and respect those who teach them and those who admonish them, how they should love those who work among them for the Lord. They should not rebel against their work, but they should live at peace with each other. 
So there is an example of Christian people who are humble and they're willing to listen to God's word as brought to them by their spiritual leaders and they love each other and they get along with each other. See, that is the peace that exists within this thing called the Lord's church. We're even supposed to be at peace, not only with each other in the church, we're called to be at peace with people um, outside of the church as well. Like in Romans 12, 17 and 18, Paul writes, Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to revenge, to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. That's Romans 12, 17 through 19. So we need to pay attention to what Paul says there. We're not to strike out in revenge. Even when we're done wrong, a Christian needs to leave room for the wrath of God, it says. And that means that God sees what's going on, right? God sees it, and, and on the day when he comes, what's he going to do? He's going to set it all right. right. He's going to do the right thing. And so the reason that we're told to live at peace with everyone is because we are supposed to be leading other human beings into relationship with the Heavenly Father. The reason why God's people need to be examples of peace and love and grace and mercy and faith and justice and hope is because when we're the opposite of those things, when we're being the opposite of those things, we're showing our disbelief in the gospel. It's just like when scripture says, unless we forgive, we cannot be forgiven. Christians are to be examples of these things. They are to be examples of forgiveness because we preach a message of forgiveness. And so when we don't forgive, we're seen as being liars and hypocrites. It's the same with all of these other words we've looked at over the last month or so, right? If we preach love, but we're unloving, if we are ungracious, if we're not merciful, what do we make God out to look like? We make God look like a liar. If we preach that God offers the sinner peace and his people are at war with each other and everyone else, we, we negate the message of the gospel. It's like during our recent prayer time, um, one of our elders, Dennis Sahura, shared his heart and his vision for First Christian Church. And he brought in the biblical imagery of a shining city on a hill. Brothers and sisters, we cannot be that unless we learn how to love, how to show mercy and grace, start putting our faith into action, start standing for real justice. There's no hope without Jesus and his church. So let's commit to being people of peace. Let's pray together today. Father God, I come to you right now. I pray for anybody who is uh, contemplating making a decision for you that they will do that this week. I thank you so much for some of the decisions we've seen recently. I pray you be with your church, not only here in Meadville, but also across the country and across the world, that we uh, rediscover your mission and that we become serious about it and humble ourselves to you to be trained to what it looks like to be a servant of people, a servant of yours, that we use our gifts and abilities and everything that you've put at our disposal to expand your kingdom. And so all these things I pray in Jesus' name, amen.